myself uh, maybe a few of you or a lot of you have not never seen me in the office like this i usually have a beard but uh uh, my name is Pedro Martinez, and I am part of the takeoff team from Fremont. Uh, and today we will be talking about project setup and the prototype units. Now, Ryan will assist me with uh, monitoring any questions, any raised hands. Uh, but feel free to just unmute yourself and ask any questions at any time. Uh, there is a slide at the end for questions, but Feel free to jump in at any time. Um, so let's get to it. Um, uh, the first uh, key things that you should be taking away from this uh, presentation is uh, the importance of having accurate details coming from jumpstart all the way through uh, takeoff. Um, how family names under a detail number description help the downstream team. And the last key would be feedback from users is key. Cool. Uh, the purpose of this stage uh, when we first started was uh, to pretty much translate the Revit data into AutoCAD. Uh, we do takeoff, we work with um, AutoCAD and our model is being done in Revit. So we need to translate that data into AutoCAD in order for us to do a metal, glass, and miscellaneous takeoffs. Now for this stage, we don't really deal with the glass. The glass pretty much comes straight forward from Revit. Uh, the translation is there for us. So all we have to do is the metal miscellaneous takeoffs. And then the second part of it was to create and upload standard typical data and fabs to the server so that we can reuse that data in future projects. Uh, we don't always want to start from scratch if we've already done it once. So uh, that was the main goal of reusing data as much as possible. So just a quick overview of when does this uh, stage happen? We usually start three weeks, two to three weeks before metal takeoff. Uh, it takes about two weeks to complete this process, depending on how typical or how unique the job is. It can be easy, it can go super hard. Uh, but we always have this like, time constraint of two to three weeks because as you can see we we always have uh metal takeoffs back to back uh so we try to take advantage of the the little gaps that we have so uh two to three weeks and move on to the next and next 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 job uh so uh if we were to take uh, matilda commons building a uh that's my goal for metal takeoff so then we would be starting uh, May 4th, which is three weeks before the metal, metal start. So uh, as of right now, there is a little gap. So we haven't started, but they're still doing the modeling uh, in drafting. So we haven't started yet. So, uh, but that's what we try to shoot for, two to three weeks. Uh, before metal takeoff. Some preparation that is necessary before starting a job. Uh, we like to get familiar with each job. Nothing too into depth because most of it is trying to get typical asking questions here and there, but at least getting familiarized with general information as in who's the PM, who's the drafter, uh, what shop it's going to be in, and then what field supervisor does this job fall under. Uh, we jump into this stage before metal takeoff and we start looking at shop drawings and we come up with questions. So sometimes it's about who do we ask these questions to? Uh, if we ask the PM, will they have the answer? 
or if we ask the shop, they can give us a better answer than the PM. So uh, we, we like to know who and what and where uh, all this general information. That way we can ask the correct question to the correct person. Uh, another thing that we do is every job has unique dyes. Uh, mostly 90% of them do. Uh, some of them don't have new dyes, but always check and verify that any new dye have been approved and are up on the server. And later on, we will see why that is important uh, to make sure that the dyes are up to date and have been approved. It all comes into play in the, into our data, into our layout, uh, in our de detailing. So uh, it's, it's a real important uh, item there. And then uh, the last thing is to know which PDF is the latest and greatest shop drawings. Uh, we started, when we started off about two years ago, roughly over two years ago, this stage, we started off doing uh, using the profiles, but since then we've moved on to, hey, let's use the latest and greatest shop drawings because sometimes details change and they get updated. And so that way we do uh, all the work and data with the latest and greatest details that are on there instead of from what we started uh, to change. So always find what the latest and greatest shop drawings are. Uh, so once we have all of our preparations, we are ready to start. So one of the key things that I do is we send out an email informing the team. Uh, this is Esley's team and stage one team, Tony and uh, Joe right now. Uh, and we let everybody know, hey, we're starting with the, let's use uh, Ardenwood as, a, as an example. We're starting prototype stage one for Ardenwood. Uh, if there's any updates to family names that are in Ardenwood, please let me know. Uh, we go straight to the source, which is Esley and her team, which deal with family names. And they know when, in, when a family name gets updated. So they have a list of all the jobs that uh, have that specific family name that was updated. So I'm letting them know, hey, Ardenwood, Keep a flag out just in case, let me know. Uh, once I send out my email, uh, we, get, we start creating this uh, prototype unit matrix that we call. And we'll see that in the next, next slide. Uh, in order to create this, we study the latest and greatest shop drawings and decide what details are typical throughout the entire job. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time to look at the entire job and get all the data for it. But what we would like to do is get the majority of the building standardized and with data. So looking at the details and looking at the elevations and studying it well, we decide what details are pretty typical around the entire building. And we start creating, combining details to create these prototype units. Uh, and this includes the family names in there. So one of the key things that I mentioned earlier was you will find out how important it is for us to have that family name at the details. Uh, if we do not have that family name in the bottom of the detail description, we have to go to either profiles or a specific um, set that Esli marks up with the names, or we have to open up the Revit uh, model to find out where are the families, or we can run this report from the takeoff uh, called the Revit um, family report. Brings, gives us a list of all the family names that are in the model, but they do not tell us, hey, this one is on page 501, this one's on page 551. None of that information is there. So if we can have that family name underneath that detailed description, that would be golden because we get all of our information with just one set of shop drawings. Um, so 
a complete prototype unit matrix. I am going to show you what that is. As of now, we are doing this matrix in a in an Excel sheet. What hap what there's a lot of information going on and I try to cord color coordinate because a lot of us are visual. So if we see something we can tie A and B together with colors. So as you can see here, I have uh, the unit type. It's just different numbering. So there's 18 total units that I have here for Ardenwood, uh, 18 prototype units. And as you can see, every row has a sill, has a head, and has a horizontal. Sometimes they have even two or three horizontals. Uh, in the case for number four, there is no horizontal. It's just a sill and a head. Now the color coordination, that means that all of that unit one through six are coming across a captured right jam and a captured left jam. So this is on the left, this is on the right, and then top and bottom pretty much. And same thing goes for the orange. The orange only has two units, which is captured male vertical and captured female vertical. Uh, and it only has the combination of these two. So as you can see here, I give a description of the detail, what it is, and then the family name. Uh, so a quick, quick show of what I mean of the family right underneath the detailed des description is this family name that is under here is golden to us. Why? Because we tie data to this family name right here 6 11 16 is pretty much talking about the sill track right we tie data to this 11 17 x we tie data to this sill member with that specific face off so if all of this information is in one pdf perfect that's what we want we don't want to be opening up two three different pdfs because uh, it can get hectic, confusing, time consuming, and extra stuff that if everything's in one, perfect. Uh, so I translate all that information into this Excel uh, because I use this Excel quite a lot. And that way, all the information is in one, one place. So I write down the detail, a little description, and the family name of that particular detail. Same thing goes with the verticals, what vertical, and then the family corresponding to that vertical. Uh, any questions? Perfect. Um, Real quick, just to serve these clear, like that family name is company driven. So it's not like job specific, it's, it's that's unique to the company. So if Pedro does that family, the 1117X, you know, O three DL, and that gets used on another job. Then he's he doesn't have to repeat it because that data is on the server. So he only does those once. You know, for the company, for each each one. So the more they're reused, the less he has to do the next time. So. Correct. So, like in this case, I believe some of these Ardenwood families were used previously in uh, Brokaw jobs. So some of these families already existed before we we did shop drawings for Arden one. So that's the type of thing that the stage is all about, reusing data, creating, standardizing, uploading to the server so we can reuse again. So we decide what details are typical uh, and what verticals are typical. And keep in mind that these heads and sills are, do not happen in your, do not have to happen in your model. These I'm just putting together uh, to just create prototypes. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's how they happen in your, in your job. So if I go back to this, um, what is a prototype? Uh, it is a unit that has a minimum of four conditions that happen in the job, in the project. Uh, in this case on the left, we can see that there's six, there's actually six conditions. 
two at the bottom, two at the horizontal, and then two at the head. So a minimum of four because not all units have a horizontal, but they at least have a, a head and a sill. Now the prototypes, uh, the dimensions on them, they're just general, they're not specific. Uh, we just typically say, hey, 60, five foot wide unit by 12 feet. That's what we typically do uh, at the job. Sometimes they're smaller, they're taller, or they're, they're shorter in width or wider. Uh, so what we try to do is just do prototypes with the standard generic dimensioning. Uh, same goes with the conditions. Uh, we just match sills with heads. Uh, what we try to do sometimes is uh, if we have a stack sill, we'll combine it with the stack head at the top. Uh, but everything on here is generic, not job specific. What's job specific is all the conditions out here at the corners, which is pretty much the intersections of a vertical and a horizontal. That it is job specific. In this job, I have a 502 detail that's going to cross a five. 51 vertical so that condition does exist in your in your in your job that we're working on um, so if we go on to the next page uh, how it works in the takeoff just you know dim it down a little bit uh, in the takeoff we use AutoCAD and the takeoff program in conjunction uh, to create fab tickets that we'd later on release uh, to the to the shop and then the shop creates the actual parts right the actual units so what we do is we have a project detail window that pretty much this is where we store all of our data uh, pertaining to the families uh, in the next slide we'll get a little bit more into depth of this window but what happens is we store data here and then in AutoCAD we create the taglines that reference back to the actual data that is in here that later on becomes a BIM. So the BIM is pretty much a building information modeling. That's what it stands for. Uh, it generates a 3D model of the unit that we created with the taglines. Uh, it represents, again, like what I said, it represents the data that is on the project details. So whatever is on your shop drawings, we should see it on the BIM itself. So that's what we're gonna see in today's presentation, how data goes through this process to become a BIM. And then from here, where do we go? So the project detail window. The, the project detail window exists in AutoCAD. Uh, this is a window we can see as soon as we uh, open AutoCAD. Uh, it has a detail table, a use table, a rules table, assembly, and miscellaneous. Now, like I mentioned before, when we do this data entry, it is for metal and miscellaneous. There's no glass in this particular uh, stage. Uh, so to explain the window, Details have two tables, the rules table and the part use table. The part use table uses a certain nomenclature that identifies different conditions of the tagline. So our tagline is going to use this name called InJam. And then the conditions are the ones after the dash in parapet S, 250S, to in parapet S, 250S. Uh, later on, I'll show you a document that we came up with, which is the nomenclature for the use uh, of all these taglines. We had to come up with the name for all these taglines because certain taglines, we need certain adjustments, certain notches. Uh, so we need to differentiate all the different cases for it. As you can see on the description of the part uses, uh, the very top one is uh, for a stack sill with the wind load notch. The second one is an Inviso stack head. And then the third one is an Inviso parapet with a strip head used as a parapet head. Uh, so things can get 
pretty weird and complicated right away. Um, but yeah, so going back to the window, every detail has a use and a rules. Uh, I won't get too much into the rules because that will just uh, get a little confusing. But that rules pretty much uh, the program makes its own matrix uh, and combines all this these three different combinations together. So we have three rules that the matrix makes nine possible combinations for, and that's where the rules come in play for us. So we don't have to de create every single combination. We'll just create the source ones, and then the other, in this case, we create three, the other six get derived from these three. And that's a little bit of what the rules are, but don't want to confuse any, anybody out there. Peter, I really think I have a question. Yes. Is does this information come from CAD? When you how does this information get into the system? So that's what we're gonna get into next. Uh, oh. this okay. this is the data that stage one prototypes creates if it does not exist in the server. Oh, okay. So it comes from the server, but if there's no data existing, we create it and then upload it to the server. Okay, got it, thank you. Good question. So every detail has a use, as we can see here, and then every use has an assembly table, which is the part number here, and then miscellaneous. So we tie all of the metal and miscellaneous parts to this specific family right here. That's why it's important for us to know what family we are working with and what detail, because the family name is the key thing to tie data from Revit to AutoCAD to when we do our metal takeoff. Um, so now it's time to create your first prototype unit. What we do is we look at the first unit in the matrix and we gather all the family names that create that unit and we check to see if the families exist on the server. Now there's two options, it exists and it does it. If it exists, we'll go ahead and copy the data from the server to our project. Perfect. If it does not, we automatically know that that, da that data does not exist, we need to create it. So once we're done copying that data to, from the server into our project, we need to check and see if the conditions exist inside the family. Uh, if it does exist, then we're pretty much ready to go. We can run UPD on our unit and we should have parts right away. If the conditions do not exist, we still have to create data for it. So there's a, there's a few steps. It's, family and then we have to check the conditions inside that family and make sure that they exist. Uh, so we'll go over three different uh, examples right now because uh, there's three different outcomes. It's all the data is on the server. Your second one is the family exists but your condition doesn't and three none of the data is in the, is in the server. So hey, Pedro. Yes sir. Uh, we had a question uh, from Rudy. What, can you explain what is UPD? Okay, UPD just stands for update from what I know. Steve? It's update <laughs> database. Yeah, it's, oh, okay. If you, yeah, if, you watch, if you watch the thing last from uh, Saul, he also runs UPD. It's basically a feature that just updates the data in the database. So. When you run EPD, you're really updating the data in the database. Yes. So what happens is on AutoCAD, we create a unit just with lines, which we call taglines. So we draw the lines, and then what we do is we tie data into those taglines, into that tagline, and call it a certain family name. Then what we have to do is we have to run UPD in order to get a bit. So that's where the BIM comes into play. Uh, if you don't run BIM, uh, your taglines do not get updated and you, you'll only see a 2D unit just with lines. So, good question. 
cool. Uh, who's ready for a live demo? <laughs> me, 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 me. I want to see it. <laughs> All right, Ron, here we go. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this first unit on 518. We're going to work with this SIL, which is 1117A003D. What happens? I find out my family. Okay, perfect. This right here is my server standard details. This is what lives up in the server. These, this is where all the data that I, uh, we have created in, I don't even know how long, maybe 20 years, 40 years that we've been here, everything that we have so far. So what I do is we look for that specific family. Uh, so I have it up here as well. UW75, 1117, so we look for it, 1117. Oh, look, it exists. Where is it at? 17X, download. Perfect, I make sure that it exists. So what I do is I just go ahead and copy it and I paste it into our project details. So now we have it right here. So then once we paste it, what we do is we open up the CAD version of that family. There's a CAD version and there's a Revit version. Uh, and then what we do is we compare what we have here to what we have on our shop drawings. One, we want to make sure that all the parts that are in the shop drawings exist in the family. And two, we are looking for accuracy layout. Layout accuracy, sorry. We want to make sure that at the end of the day, this face stop is here and not somewhere else where it shouldn't be. Um, so that's, that's a key thing uh, in our details is, we need uh, the details to be accurate because if they are not accurate, we cannot run our layout, which comes after we do all the data entry. So the layout will then be referenced by the taglines, which later creates the BIM and tells the, the BIM, hey, I want you to extrude this die this way. So we'll, we'll see how it all flows. Um, so we compare, and then what we do is we, we see all the parts that are in here. Every name that doesn't have extra stuff is a tagline that we have to draw. So that means that in this FSL 1364, we have this exterior stop with all its miscellaneous down here. This SIL S169D has a SIL mem a strip SIL member with its miscellaneous. So in this first try, we found out that it does, does exist. All of the information in here exists. Now what we have to do is find the condition. The condition that we're working with, if we go to our unit matrix, this, what we're working with is unit four. Unit four has a captured right jam and captured left jam. So the conditions on the right and left of this sill are going to be jams. So as you can see here, we have a jam to jam, jam to jam, and then field use jam to jam. Perfect. We don't have to create anything. We brought all this data straight from the server and it's ready to go. Um, so if we were to just pretty much UPD the unit, we should get a full part where it goes jam to jam. So now second second uh, situation where the family name exists, but the condition doesn't. Uh, this one, we're going to go with the uh, 1106X, which is 501. 501 shows a curtain wall sill in this case with the same face stop but a curtain wall sill instead of a strip sill so what we do is we look we look at our server we copy and paste it and so now it's here we look 
Okay, there's two taglines. So it's telling us that this family has a face stop and a sill. And let's make sure that all the parts are the same. 1364, 1364, 1106X, 1106X. So we have all of our parts, but now what we have to do is we have to look and see if the condition exists. And as we see here, this is a corner invert vert. So the, the jam does not exist. So what we gotta do is, hey, we're not starting from scratch. We're using what we have to build on. So we're not starting from scratch. So what we do is we just grab one, copy and paste, and then just rename the condition. And there we go. Now the names, how did I get the names? The names come from this no, uh, naming convention document that we made. Uh, it tells us and shows us how our sills would be made, how would they be named? Uh, all the stack heads, sophic conditions, and it keeps going. It doesn't have every existing detail in there, but it has most of the typical generic ones that we encounter. Uh, face stops, and then it changes to verticals, corners, segmented. So if we see the jam one, the jam one right here, creating a generic name for a jam. Uh, it tells you in jam if it's inviso jam, jam if it's a captured. In our case, we had it captured, and then the measurement from the Revit reference line to the DLO, which is pretty much from the edge of jam to DLO. So pretty much the name that we had to do for our conditions was jam 275. That's where we got the jam. Now, how did we get the sill? The sill one, this is how we got it. It's the fir first step is, is it inviso or captured? Uh, in our case, it was uh, captured, so it would be sill. Then second step is, is it a strip wall, curtain wall, or a stack joint? In our case, it was a curtain wall. And then the third step, it was, it's the measurement of the wind load or dead load that we have. Uh, an example, two and seven sixteenths becomes 2.44. So we just take out the decimal and round uh, to the three, de three digits. Then the last one tells us, hey, wind load or dead load? And that's how we come up with the name for all these parts. Uh, we'll see that come into play into, in the next portion of uh, creating data. Uh, right now, we didn't really have to figure out what the name was because we already had pre-existing data. So we know that the name for that SIL is SIL C194W. So that's the nice thing about having data. You can always use it and not start from scratch. Use it to create more and more. So then once we have our use, we'll go into the part. Every part has a, an adjustment every time uh, uh, the verts change these adjustments we have to go ahead and uh, change them uh, the adjustments for for this particular combination condition it's minus two and three quarters because the tagline goes all the way to the edge of jam if we go to the tagline will go all the way to the edge of jam so our sill member usually stops daylight. So what happens is our adjustment for that tagline, we have to come back this dimension. So our tagline goes all the way to the edge, but our actual part needs to stop two and three quarters from that point. So once we do all the adjustments, We'll go ahead and make sure that all the miscellaneous is correct. In this case, for the jam, we are just missing the HP1s. Hope everybody knows what the HP1s are, because those are easily missed. And those are these, uh, as you can see here, we need access holes for the 
uh, to screw in the sill member. Uh, we do not call them out here, but they are these little uh, plugs that we use to plug the access hole. Uh, once we're done, we'll go ahead and hit apply, and then we'll create the next one for the face stop and all that good stuff. So that's pretty much the second condition, as in like, hey, the condition doesn't exist, but the family does. So it's pretty easy to just copy and paste the use and then just rename it. When it's hard, it's stage three, when we're gonna use this UW751154ST as an example. We'll go in here, hey, this is similar, but we want wind load instead of dead load. It doesn't exist at all. So when that happens, we have to pretty much go in here and just create all, all the data from scratch. And it's kind of painful, but the good thing is we only do it once for this particular family and then we're done. Sometimes what we do is we, in this case, it's a unique family name. What we'll do is we'll go look for a standard family and if it exists, we can copy and start from there instead of starting from scratch. We never want to start from scratch. We'll rather start from something and then build up from there. So with this scratch one, we pretty much have to look at what we're, what we're building and how we're gonna be naming it. So we have to go back to the actual nomenclature as, hey, what kind of sill am I getting? What kind of name for my sill am I getting, you know? So just following those three, four steps, I should be getting a name for my, for my sill. Now, once I have a full detail, uh, let's say I'm done inputting all the data. What comes next? What comes after data entry? What comes next is called a uh, running the layout to our parts. What we do is we use the same layout that is given to us in our um, families. We use that same detail to run our layout which then helps run our BIM. So what we do is uh, we click on the use and we go ahead click on this little green plus line and what it does it, it asks us where the tagline is located. So we click where the tagline is located and what it's going to do it's going to bring in all the dies that are in that use. Pretty much all the parts that I wrote, that we wrote down in here are gonna show up there. So in this case, we only have one. Sometimes we have three or four. They will all show up just as you see here. Now, going back to when checking for dies and making sure that they're approved, this is one of the cases where I look at them and I see, hey, my die that's coming in doesn't match what's on my detail. What's wrong? Two options. Either my die is the one that's wrong. As you can see here, it's just overlaid. Either my die is the one that's wrong. What we have on the server is not the correct die. Or two, the detail that we created has the wrong die in it. So when we run, when we run uh, our layout for our BIM, we just overlay it based on whatever the detail shows. And as you can see here, it looks like the die has been updated. So it's not matching my, so what I do is I just make sure that it, it's on my pocket and I go and see, and I'm seeing most of it, and I see where the changes are. It looks like the detail was created before this die got updated, so this die got updated on the thickness of it, as we can see there. So this is where I would just flag it and be like, hey, this detail is wrong, so 
who created the detail as a team. So what I do is we usually, hey, uh, as a team, family name, so-and-so does not match the die. Can we please update it when we get a chance? And then they'll go ahead and run the update. It's a minor thing, but uh, we like to keep things up to date. And that's how we find similar things where dies do not match the actual detail. So once we run the layout, we'll go ahead and discard, but we would save it, hit apply. The layout, it's going to tell the BIM how do you want to extrude your die when we run UPD. Where should we place it in regards to the intersection point of the tagline? So if we do the layout for the face stop, the face stop is gonna have the same tagline location, but the face stop is gonna be off to the side. Hopefully it doesn't take too long or crash. There we go. So as you can see here, we have the gasket and we have the face stop in re relationship to the to the tagline. So all of the layouts, we always reference the tagline where it's gonna come up. So now once we do our data entry that includes our layout, we'll go ahead and create a unit. These taglines, as you can see here, I have two. Uh, it, all, it looks like one, but I really have two lines, two taglines, one above the other one, because I wanna keep, they, they go, on, at the same spot. Uh, one is for the actual sill member, one is for the actual face stop. So what we do is we create our unit and then run UPD. Once we run UPD, we'll get mark numbers. Every part is going to get some type of mark number. So once we run UPD, we are able to see a 3D version of what our actual taglines should represent. Um, so as you can see, if we see from the bottom up, well, let me see, let me start here. Uh, if we look at this, this is the strip that we were looking at in our other detail. Let's see. If we see this detail, we'll see that that's what it represents. It does not have the sill track and it does not have the field use insert, but it has everything the unit itself needs uh, to be assembled. Uh, this is where we start seeing notches, we start seeing gaskets, we start seeing placements of face stops and horizontals, and then angles that go on top. Uh, and if we see from the top, this view is the view we see our. Um, our shop drawings pretty much. If we see here, this is the right, this is the left, sorry, we're the left jam. Glass is here, it's a one piece. If we go here, go to the left side, this is the jam, uh, one piece. And then the glass should go here. Right now we don't have glass, we don't really do much with glass in this stage, so. Um, once we have a BIM, we can start going fab to fab, making sure that we have all the notches, all the gaskets that are typical for this job. So like in this case, we pre-attached an angle. Every, this angle needs some type of note. We'll go ahead and create this note. Uh, this is a strip head. We need to make sure we have the notches for the mini Mac clips, uh, the location up here for the actual angle. So we'll, We'll take our time creating all these notches if they don't exist or if they don't exist. We'll, we'll create them and standardize them. We'll talk to um, a checker and then of course the programmer, which is Tony and have a dialogue of, hey, how do you want this notch to work? Where do you want it? Where is the best thing to do? And so on. So what we do, create the BIM, go one by one through the fab tickets themselves and make sure that they have all the gaskets, notches, and anything that needs to get pre-attached in them. What happens then is we print this unit out for checking. Uh, the project coordinators do not check in 3D. They do not check in AutoCAD. What they do is they instead check 
in PDF. It's a lot easier to, to run through a unit in PDF. We link all the parts with the part numbers, as you can see, as a mark number, sorry. All the parts have a unique mark number with them. So if we print out a PDF, this is what it pretty much looks like. If you click on them, it'll tie in with the vertical. Uh, all the checkers go through the verticals. Uh, green means it's okay. Red means uh, they disagree with what's on the on the fab ticket. So they'll go through through this entire unit, checking every single mark number, and then um, they'll let you know, hey, unit four is ready for update. So once the unit is is ready for updating. We go in there and start checking, okay, why did they mark this up? Okay, the hook lug on this one is off by three eighths. So then what I go do is I'll go back to my unit, uh, move my hook lug, uh, move my hook lug, and then rerun UPD until I pretty much have completed the task and I'll go ahead and mark it off, save it, move on. So I pretty much check everything that the checker has updated. And then uh, we update everything that's marked up. Now, sometimes what's marked up, uh, we need a little bit more information on, or I'm just confused on why it's marked up. So I'll ask the PC, hey, why is this marked up? And then we'll just, oh, okay, that's why. So then uh, we'll agree on it. So once we have updated the, all the units, uh, all the data and fabs have been standardized and have been okayed. They've been checked. Now everything is ready for everything is ready for upload. Let me see where am I at? Right here. Sorry. So everything is ready for uh, it to be uploaded to the server. As we've seen, the server standard detail is where we store all of our information, all of our data. The way we tie it is with the Revit resource, which is the family names. Uh, this is where we upload all of our data. Uh, on the right side, this is where we upload all of our fabs to. So data and fabs are the ones that are uploaded. Um, Pros and cons about stage one. Uh, the pro is uh, only typical data is standardized and uploaded. So this data that we create gets standardized, uploaded to the server, ready to be reused uh, in a separate project. Uh, we can reuse this data in the future, like I said, in jobs, just like Ardenwood used a lot of families from Broca. Uh, and then, as you see, we use the shop drawings a lot. We see family names early before metal takeoff. So we get to ask questions early on in the process. Some of the cons is not all the data gets standardized and uploaded to the server that is used for that job. Uh, only the typical is standardized and then the rest that gets created. Some of it gets standardized, but not all of it. And then anything that's created after, ha we haven't found a way to bring it back. We've tried but haven't found a full on effect like, hey, this works and we can do this. So for now, we're still currently working on that. Uh, any updates to shop drawings become comments only. Uh, since it's such a short window and close to metal takeoff, uh, we don't have, whenever there's a question that comes up that we ask, none of that can get updated right away because shop drawings have been uh, sent out for approval or have to wait for another delta. So that's the only bad part uh, about if we were to start earlier, we would be able to, hey, work with drafting and before they publish, we can be like, hey, we have a few things that we would like to incorporate before you publish. Uh, and then the last thing is we have an inaccurate unit matrix. This unit matrix that I create is based on just what we see when we analyze the shop drawing. So, uh, as you see in the next, as you'll see in the next stage, uh, we're working on how to make this a more accurate process. But as of now, 
it, it's somewhat accurate for typical, but we can still miss a few things here and there. Our future state, we are, like I mentioned, working on trying to improve this stage. Uh, one of the things that we, I just added this first point because of this morning's presentation is using BIM 360 design to access a model that we can probably detach and start dissecting, creating units straight from the model that we can give feedback to the, to the drafting department and be like, hey, uh, we would prefer something different here or we're missing stuff here or can we update this? So using BIM 360 uh, design and this, and working also on getting uh, precise reports coming straight from the model instead of a human, you know, that, you know, has error and coming from the model, it gives you a more precise report on what intersect intersections conditions you have on the left and right. Right now, we, we just have a brand new report that's called the intersection report that tells us all the intersections of a certain family. It tells you family one intersects with family two, five, seven, and nine, and it's real accurate because it comes straight from the model. So bring in reports like that in the near future that will help us be more precise. Uh, increasing the amount of standard data being used and uploaded. So bringing more of the standardizing and having uh, more time to create this data. Right now we usually do typical, but what if we could do most of the, most of the job? Doesn't matter how many families we, we have. Creating all that standard data and uploading with their respective families up to the server, that would be amazing. Uh, with all this, we would get feedback back to drafting before metal takeoff. So we would, need more time to work on this but maybe starting seven to eight weeks instead of three weeks before metal takeoff will give us more time to increase the standard data that's being used and uploaded uh, and then give that feedback back and get an actual uh, detail update instead of just being a comment on a shop crying uh, but with all this we would need more time and we would need more personnel up front in the in the stage one Um, any questions? One at a time. So, Pedro, that's a nice preview of the things that we're working on in our phase three Kaizen, and especially the feedback loops that we're envisioning that can happen if we do this process early on so that we can work with the drafting department. If we see that they're developing something that looks a little unusual, we can have that discussion and maybe steer uh, a little bit more towards a standard way to approach something. So just having that feedback loop built into the way that we do our work could be a big benefit to create um, very good source information. Yes, of course. <laughs> and it's a future state, but it might be a near future thing that will help us uh, a lot because all this data that's not being standardized and reused is just going to waste. So if we can just put more time in upfront, standardize it, save it on the server, we can always reuse it. You want to mention anything about the intersection report just briefly? How, how we plan to use that to the data in the front? So yeah. Getting um, precise uh, reports, accurate reports coming straight from the model, we have this intersection report that tells us what families intersect with what families. So then that gives us a better understanding of what data do we really need to create? Because uh, from what doing just a unit matrix as of right now, uh, there's projects, mostly all of them, that we have missed typical uh, intersections because. They've occurred only in certain spots that we didn't see, we missed, or we just completely didn't notice, right? So being with that accurate precision and report, we can definitely get away from missing data, uh, which is key when it comes to metal takeoff. Anything that is not 
created before metal takeoff during that week, they need to create that same data and still push metal takeoff. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to prep as much for metal takeoff so that metal takeoff can be only focused on just metal takeoff, glass takeoff, and miscellaneous takeoff. And then what, what goes with that is everything we create, we save it. We upload it to the server for future use if, if, if needed, you know? Anything you would want to add, Eric? Uh, no, I mean, it's just like, kind of like what Bill said, if the more personnel we put up front, the more, the quicker we find issues and problems with the design and whatnot. So then we have the chance to like tackle it quicker. So by the time it gets to the weekly releases, we don't have that person who's rushing through trying to get that weekly release, trying to, you know, juggle between finding, solving problems for the design and producing the actual fab. So that's the, the theory behind putting, front loading a bunch of um, people up front. So Pedro, yeah. Coming from a PM perspective, this might be a loaded question, but I'm gonna ask it. Um, what, what could a PM do during this process to make it go faster and you know, more productive for you guys? Um, maybe helping out with questions that we have, following through, uh, taking some of that workload, like, hey, if there's a question, I can bring it up to you, and then you can go ahead and find it while I create data, and then you bring back, try to bring back some type of solution, either with the drafter, super, shop, or anything like that, uh, okay. and then probably making sure that the shop drawings have all the quality details that we need, like I mentioned again, that just having that family name in there saves us a bunch of time so just little things that we really need and take off would really help you know following through the uh the drafting shop drawings all of that will prep us for this stage i think okay and then just a quick note about how did we get to building prototype units we had a 10 minute unit kaizen where we wanted to be able to create units in a 10 minute cycle as they go through the uh, the takeoff process that would allow us to do weekly releases that would match with what the shop's pace is so keeping that tax time so we implemented the prototype units stage in order to develop uh, the upfront data that we thought we would be able to use to get to that 10 minute unit phase so far we haven't been able to reach that and that's why we're starting to examine this phase three where we're looking at actually doing more of the data up front, because ultimately we want to match the tack time of the shop. Correct. So last thing, as you've heard it a lot, the number one thing that we want to do is create data, put it up in the server so we can reuse it, you know? Never start from scratch. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today at two o'clock. We'll be here at the same time, same channel next week. Uh, <laughs> three o'clock drafting has a floor if you guys want to join. But thank you everybody. Have a good day. Thank you, Thanks, Pedro. Pedro. That was great. Thanks, Pedro. Yeah, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Pedro. Thanks, Pedro.